Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. Our videotaping today is sponsored by the Historic Preservation Fund of the U.S. Department of the Interior through the Nebraska State Historical Society and the City of Lincoln, a certified local government. Our speaker today is Ed Zimmer. Ed is a City of Lincoln Preservation Planner, a position that he's held for 27 years. Before coming to Lincoln, Ed was a freelance architectural historian in Boston. He's native to Omaha, and he has an undergraduate degree from Lindenwood College and a PhD from Boston University. Ed's talk today is, um, we both love beautiful things, Anna and Frank Hall's Lincoln. Please join me in welcoming Ed Zimmer. Thank you for coming. You notice I had to drop the both from the title. The archival research showed that as lovely as that word was in the title, apparently it wasn't in Anna's statement, so it had to come out. I preferred her, I preferred the mistaken version. But in the interest of accuracy, which will be the only bowing to accuracy that I will admit to today. <laughs> this talk revolves around a wonderful exhibit that's at the Sheldon Museum currently, and it will run through September 14th. Um, and it's about this pair of Lincolnites, Anna and Frank Hall, whose own personal collection and then their bequests in their will formed the core of what became Sheldon Museum. And not so much the building, that's named for the Sheldons because they were the principal um, givers of the building, but the contents and up to a quarter of the objects at the Sheldon came through either the personal collection or later purchases from the gifts um, given by the halls. So a major impact and a wonderful exhibit which you can go and enjoy at the Sheldon through the uh, middle of September. And so I think this is a very timely program because as it runs on Channel 5 right up to about the middle of September, we keep announcing this wonderful exhibit. So I'm not going to do the exhibit. You can go do that at the Sheldon, and I hope you do. Um, I'm going to talk about, and we'll talk basically from that tired perspective I bring of an architectural historian about Anna and Frank Hall and what we see of their impact on the built place of Lincoln. Um, we see them at the Sheldon in the, the art history and the art life of the community, but they also have an impact that I think we can see throughout the community if we look at their places and the places they were related to. And so that's what I will attempt to do. And we'll begin with their home place um, down at 11th and D Streets. Um, they didn't build this house. Um, a man named Richard Outcult built it. Um, he was a bank cashier. How could a bank cashier afford to build such a big, <laughs> lovely place? When he went to jail, he lost the house. Um, <laughs> built about 1884 um, and really is a spectacular example of the Queen Anne style, one of our finest in town. The Halls bought it. Um, they'd come to Lincoln about 1880. Uh, he was a very young lawyer in town. He had gone to Peru State, or what we would call Peru State, Peru Normal um, College when he went and met um, Anna there. And then he moved up and finished his education in Lincoln. And they married in 1882. Um, Twelve years later, they had risen in uh, local society sufficiently that they could buy Mr. Outcult's house. 1894 was maybe a good time to build a, to buy a great big house because the crash of 1893 um, had meant unless you had very stable income, you were in some trouble. Um, Frank and Anna weren't. If we look closely at the house on the Sanborn Atlas, as we see um, on this 1891, that it's a simple rectangular outline, the porches look smaller than we might think of them today. Um, there's already a carriage house behind it, marked two for two stories, big carriage house in the backyard. And another big house, um, I've cheated on this map and haven't turned it to the north. Um, it's the east to the top, north to the left. Um, just to the west of them is Silas Burnham's house. So they're in a good neighborhood. Mr. Burnham, leading local uh, businessman, banker, uh, industrialist. Um, and now more properly turning the house 
turning the maps to the north, by the 1903, we already see an extended porch, um, some additional houses built uh, west on the block, but, but two, they're on a big double lot. Burnham is on a big double lot beside them. They start making modifications to the house beyond that porch um, and extend the porch further, $1,500 worth in 1906. That'd be enough to build a good substantial frame house. And so they're, they're doing a lot of work in their porch and repairs in 1906. Um, and by 1928, we see the house pretty much built out. This is the year of Anna and Frank's death. Both died in 1928. The porch wraps um, all of the south side and most of the, or about half of the east side. A breakfast room has been added north of the porch. Um, we'll get to that little dotted line square out in the yard. Um, carriage house still there. And Burnham has extended his yard and is now on a triple lot beside them. So this is how we would know the house um, through much of the uh, post-hall years, the 20th century, big white house behind the iron fence on the corner. Um, some of its Queen Anne details sort of hidden by that white paint. Um, for many years of the 20th century, uh, was in the Bartunic family and was their residence uh, and a boarding house with up to about a dozen boarders in the house. Um, in little rooms. Descendants of the Bartunics, the Baronics, um, converted it, um, did lots of work, particularly on the interior, um, converted it to a bed and breakfast and their residence. Um, and then just a few years ago, the current family in the house who have restored it to a lovely paint job that brings up a lot of the Queen Anne detail. Um, uh, Pam and Greg Baker uh, have been taking wonderful care of the house for the last uh, couple of years and continue to do great work with it. When I took this picture uh, on Sunday, I was kind of charmed by that beautiful tree right in the foreground, especially as I got up closer and wondered, <coughs> had I met my first lemon tree in Lincoln? And I was pretty sure I hadn't. I thought it must have been some kind of chestnut with those big um, five or six uh, leafed clusters, but these big yellow kind of leathery fruits. Um, fortunately for me, um, Dennis Shear is working with the bakers on their beautiful lot, and he had done some of the same progression I had, but with a lot more knowledge, um, and he had gotten to the answer, which is yellow buckeye. Now that we're in the Big Ten, we cannot say that. Um, that might be offensive, <laughs> but that is what this tree is called. Um, it's not an Ohio Buckeye, it's a yellow Buckeye, and inside those big um, capsules it will produce those familiar great big and quite poisonous um, Buckeye nuts. So don't bother to go by and, um, and gather these, they're not lemons, um, but a wonderful tree. And an example of, um, on this grounds there's wonderful early landscape materials and uh, hardscape as well. Uh, this is an internet look at um, the flower proving that these really are yellow buckeye uh, clusters and uh, the nut that's produced, or the seed that's produced later in the year. So we see the house now in, in a much clearer form than we have for years um, where we can, can start to see some of that rich shingle work, um, the ornate wind, attic window on the south side, and a great big porch that wraps around. So zero in a little bit on the porch. Uh, the rounded uh, four windows with colored glass in the top, and we'll look, we'll take it. I can't give you a full tour of the interior because I put this show together quite a bit too late to ask them to tromp all the way through their house and take pictures inside, so I referred to my old pictures, which I'll apologize for on each one because they're not the baker's decoration of the house. But this porch, if we peer up under that corner roof, well, let's zero in on the old porch. Um, and then, I particularly notice those arches and the kind of lattice work that form the arch. We'll get back to that. That porch came off, but up in the, uh, in the early 20th century, but up in the roof, on the south side, you see that curved, or almost curved line. That corresponds, I believe, to that shape of the wall above it. 
and I think is a reflection uh, of a feature that they had preserved in the new porch from the old porch. Uh, this wonderful cased, must be quite a beam in there, um, cantilevering out and helping hold up that whole space above. It's just a, a beautiful porch ceiling even in the, um, all that wonderful beadwork and nice colors. Now look behind the house, you see the carriage house already in place. This view is probably um, early in the, um, this may even be before the um, hall years. This might be about 1890. The carriage house in place. The house doesn't go nearly as far back. See, we put a whole northern extension onto it. And up at the top corner, second floor of that extension, is that old porch feature from the original corner first floor porch. Didn't, nice feature, didn't throw it away, moved it up and added it to the addition um, put on the um, upper. So moved it from south to north and up a floor. But a, a nice recycling. I think we'll restart later. <laughs> I really mean it. Um, additional work in 1911 um, of a fence, which they say would replace the wooden fence. But on the application for that building permit, the et cetera, was quite a bit more exciting than just et cetera. They added a garden house at a gazebo at the north edge of the yard and brick walls on both the alley side and in a lower brick wall along the west boundary of the property. <coughs> the walls capped with terracotta uh, coping at the top. That's zeroing in on that carriage house, or not carriage house, uh, gazebo, or garden house, which has a, a smooth, uh, a shiny gla green glazed tile roof. The Lincoln painter Elizabeth Dolan painted the garden in two views for the halls uh, in 1911, or circa 1911. She, she labeled them by the time of day of the scene, but not of the year. But we know with the um, 1911 building permit, this, this should be right about, um, well, there's been some plant growth since they built the garden house, but somewhere right about the 1911, 1912 period. I couldn't resist um, trying to take my photo. <laughs> this is the difference between a computerized um, impressionist view and Elizabeth Dolan. Hers is far, <laughs> far nicer. Uh, and she can also cut out the house that's built behind it um, by the time she does the painting, I believe. <laughs> Closer look at the garden house. Um, even that latticework, which is a very substantial construction, is clearly the old uh, material. And the back of the garden house, we'll come around to that, is this fountain built into the back wall, right on the alley wall, also in terracotta. I want to take a quick look at the carriage house, which shows up in the early view and still stands and, and is both um, a garage and has a dwelling unit in it, uh, which relates back to the special permit that the uh, Baronics had obtained for the, the property. Um, in addition to the Bakers, um, they maintain a couple other dwelling units in the, in the property still today. Dolan's second view, uh, looking from the gazebo uh, south across the property, and the key features um, still remain, uh, and a wonderful uh, lotus tree that, uh, locust tree that stands just uh, south of the main stair up to the front steps. Uh, the bakers tell me that uh, by oral history they know there had been two a matched pair of those trees flanking um, that sidewalk, although I think I maybe prefer it with one so there's a little bit of openness to the yard. They didn't take it out. It, it didn't, didn't last as long as its beautiful uh, companion. And then the great porch um, that was added uh, by the halls first decade of the 20th century. 
this kind of porch we see on a couple other houses, like the Yates house, is porches that really are out, outdoor rooms. And I think print, particularly, they were outdoor summer rooms. And you see in newspaper accounts of card parties and, and summer evening parties held out on the porches, uh, which must have been quite delightful and a lot cooler um, than inside. A few interior views dating back to um, well before the um, Bakers had the house, some wonderful screens on the first floor between major rooms, great glass, both the small, simple colored panes uh, of the Queen Anne style, and then some painted or some um, leaded and decorated glass uh, with bird scenes in the two principal first floor rooms. Just brilliant, colorful glass. Wonderful fireplaces and mantles on the uh, uh, both first and second floor with tile work as well as the woodwork. Uh, this great face on the uh, right hand side of the fireplace opening. Not the baker's decoration, just my old photos. Grand staircase right inside the front entrance and at a big, st big window um, at the landing of the stair with beautiful colored glass above it. The mirror um, built in just to the side of that window would allow you from the upper floor bedroom door a view down to the front door of the house. So the residents could see who was at the door before they uh, would likely be seen. And then up in that curved corner, uh, this beautiful set of windows just spectacular, brilliant uh, glass. If we were looking out that window before about 1900, I want to look at some of the neighbors now to the Hall's house. We would look across at Mr. Zerung's house, um, a John H.W. Hawking's design, even more elaborate and fanciful Queen Anne than the Hall's house. Uh, after um, Zerung, the owners um, were H.P. Uh, Law and his wife, Frederica, and Mr. Law, a wholesale grocer with a business in Haymarket, um, died in the mid-1890s, and widow Frederica picked up the house, rotated it um, 45 degrees or so. When I clip off the 1903 Sanborn map and try to lay it on the 1891, and the dimensions on these wouldn't be absolutely accurate, but it clearly is not as big a house anymore. It's no longer two and a half stories, it's just two stories. And it seems to me maybe it is that um, southern two-thirds of the old house rearranged, but totally rearranged. The other thing we see by 1903 is that Mrs. Law has added houses at either wing, um, and those were her, her children's houses. So she built a whole family compound there on the corner with her house facing that very special intersection of 11th and D. In the original plan of Lincoln, streets are 100 feet, or right-of-ways were 100 feet wide, but certain rights of way were uh, 120 feet wide if they led to the university, like 11th Street did, or over to the park, as D Street did. So that intersection of 11th and D not only has this special house facing it, but is that huge, wide intersection of two 120-foot right-of-ways meeting, and she celebrates it with um, the house on the upper right. In this 1912 view, the neighbors both appear um, in the top corners of the um, book. This is beautiful Lincoln of 1912. And Mrs. Law's house has transformed from a Queen Anne to uh, a neoclassical, and quite a grand neoclassical in Lincoln, uh, with a colossal um, pediment on the front, two levels of porches on the front, and somehow behind that, some elements of Mr. Zerong's house. I wonder if, some el if the other third became part of one of the son's houses, but beyond, beyond my knowledge. But another very interesting house and the immediate neighbor uh, and the surviving neighbor. 
I haven't yet found a view, seems like there should be one, but I've not yet found a view of Silas Burnham's house that would have been their, their neighbor uh, directly to the west. Looking at the early census records, it's fun to kind of peer into the residence of a house. In 1900, if I recall correctly, the Burnham house has nine or ten residents, Mr. and Mrs. and five or six children and three servants, and the Hall's house, almost as big, has just four residents, um, Mr. and Mrs. Hall, a lady servant, and a coachman. Uh, Mr. Mr. Burnham had a coachman as well. I'd rather imagine the coachman lived out in that big carriage house. Down the street, moving a little bit west, just to look at a little more of the Hall neighborhood, uh, we have the uh, Watkins house at 920D, another John Hawkins, more modest Queen Anne, not a small house by any means, but another house of, of the late 1880s, another house on the National Register. Watkins was a newspaper publisher, a political figure, an early editor of the publications of the Nebraska State Historical Society. Um, I was thrilled to read Watkins' obituary in the journals of the Nebraska State Historical Society because it's pretty clear they didn't like him, or at least whoever wrote the obituary didn't. <laughs> Said he had a mind more constructive than crit more, more critical than constructive, and he took no greater pleasure than in finding small errors in the work of others, which I thought was awfully harsh. But then I went back and read some of what Watkins had edited, and the footnotes were much longer than the articles, and the footnotes were written by Watkins disagreeing with the author, oh. which an editor can do, but I think you do it before you publish, not as you publish. So maybe the, the um, obituary writer knew Mr. Watkins very well. And then this is far uh, west as I'll go, but staying on D Street, now down at 8th and D, um, the Tyler House, uh, William Tyler House of uh, 1890, another Queen Anne, but here uh, in brick and stone trim. Just across the street, um, lost, but not entirely lost, uh, was the grand uh, Charles Gear House um, on the south side of the block between 8th and 9th, um, towards 9th um, on D. And to the back of the house, we can see that carriage house um, on lot three, or we can see that carriage house behind the bungalow that was built at the front of Lock 3. So Gear's house is departed. It's not gone. Um, it, it marched off to 24th and Van Dorn, but the carriage house stayed in place um, on Lot 3 between 8th and 9th on D. Now the Halls were much larger figures in Lincoln than just um, their house and their neighborhood. Uh, Mr. Hall, uh, this isn't his obituary, although the who's who appeared in the year of his death, um, but a wonderful uh, quick write-up of Frank Hall, the lawyer, um, and mentions his early partnerships, and he had had very distinguished partnerships with uh, Turner Marquette, uh, Roscoe Pound, uh, Frank Woods, and then his ultimate partnership of Hall, Klein, Williams, establishes the lineage to the Klein-Williams law firm of today. So they very properly can trace their uh, origins back to Mr. Hall and Mr. Marquette. Uh, I particularly like, though, down towards the bottom, where it says he was active in political and civic affairs. The moving spirit of the erection of the Lincoln statue at the Capitol grounds. What a nice description among all the people who worked on that that Matt Hansen so well uh, described last month that he was the moving spirit. Um, and then also um, wanted to be remembered as head of the committee which erected the Temple Building uh, on the university campus. I'll put some of these connections uh, in chronological order, looking out um, beyond their house. Um, they, he officed in some of the principal um, premier office buildings downtown. Uh, in his earliest partnerships uh, was in the Burr Block of the late 1880s. Um, standing at the corner of 12th and O. Um, also officing here were uh, William Jennings Bryan, um, the brothers Burr, uh, who had built the building, and C.C. Uh, Burr had been mayor. Uh, this was probably the prime, ad this was the prime office address uh, in late 19th century uh, Lincoln. 
trying to put it a little more in a streetscape because it wasn't just a building, but it was a place. Um, and then in a busier, busier streetscape as we string electric wires all over the place in the first days of electrified Lincoln, which would have been late 1880s, early 1890s. Um, there's that wonderful website that um, University of Nebraska researchers have produced about the um, Sheedy murder trial, and it's beyond me yet to understand Mr. Hall's involvement, but he took a role um, assisting the prosecutor um, of the accused murder of Mr. Sheedy. Um, so you'll have to sort that one out for yourselves because that's that went beyond my architectural history to understand the legal implications there. But uh, his uh, claimed involvement and properly claimed involvement in the temple building continued his connections, um, which b grew stronger and stronger, I think, with the University of Nebraska. This was the building just off campus when originally built um, that Chancellor Andrews uh, wished to build with the help of John D. Rockefeller. Um, to considerable controversy. Uh, Rockefeller was giving $66,666 and requiring Nebraskans to raise $33,333. And I wonder, did they really build it for $99,999 or did somebody have to kick in the last dollar? Um, but Hall was instrumental in the local committee to raise and match the funds so this building could be built. It was built essentially as a student union. There was no such facility at the campus yet, uh, and its purpose was to provide a gathering place and a social uh, place for students. And quickly, they adapted one of the upper rooms as a big ballroom in order to then require that students have their parties and, and dances in this building, not in the downtown hotels and other rented facilities where they were not supervised um, by campus officials. So this was part of that as well. Um, John Latenzer of Omaha is the architect of the building. Uh, was, they began the project about 1903. Considerable controversy, including from William Jennings Bryan, about accepting Rockefeller's dirty oil money. Um, but they did, um, two thirds, one third. Um, and Hall helped raise the funds and um, the building was finished about 1906. And remains a, a great contributor to campus um, now for theater programs. Hall's going to come move his office marching westward um, on O Street. So I, I bring you busy O Street of about 1900. Um, Hall's going to stay in the um, Burr Block, which you can just see uh, as the tallest building on the left-hand side of the view, um, stays there till about 1911, 1912, uh, and then moves one block down the street for just a brief period to the Little Building, which was not a adjective but a proper noun. Uh, Mr. Little uh, was the uh, developer of the building. The Lincoln architects, um, Ferdinand Fisk, with his Cedar Rapids, Iowa uh, partner Demon uh, designed the building in 1907 uh, and built it in what we would call a Chicago style or commercial style. Simple rectangular windows, big cornice crowning the top, strong base shaft top sort of arrangement. Um, and this is where Hall moves at least for the year 1911, maybe 1912 as well. Moving probably in preparation for the Burr Block to be completely rebuilt about 1914-15, but also he's moving down the street to uh, his next building. Well, let me finish off the little building. Doesn't look quite so familiar today because it's changed so much. Late 1930s, Lincoln Liberty Life Insurance Company um, buys the building, decides rather than tear it down, they'll remodel, and they add a, they take off the cornice and put on an Art Deco windowless on the street sides, uh, limestone sixth floor, uh, and would be what we know today as the LES building. When I put this image in the show, I thought just even reading a sign that said 43 degrees would feel good. But it's been so nice the last few days that we maybe didn't need that. 
where Hall is headed with his firm um, is another block west down to First National Bank's new office building, built about 1910, 1911. Tallest building in town for all of about five or six years, um, at eight stories tall, two stories taller than the Burr block. Uh, and it's designed by the Chicago architects uh, Paul V. Highland and his partner, Mr. Green. I still don't know Mr. Green's first name. Um, they're Highland and Green when they're doing this work in Lincoln, 1910. And uh, Hall's firm moves to a seventh floor office, room 703, um, and uh, settles there for the rest of his um, work life and the rest of his life to 1928. Um, we'd now call it the Lincoln Building, another National Register building, um, and mixed, mixed use mixed-use office when it was built with bank below and offices above, um, now offices and residences. And it lost its cornice but still has um, real good, clear uh, commercial style characteristics and it's listed on the National Register as well. This connection to Highland and Green um, take us out through several other uh, very interesting properties in Lincoln. And it isn't just that Hall is officing there, he's a director of First National Bank. And as we start tracking other projects by these architects, um, they all have connections back to Frank Hall. Um, but another fabulous downtown building before I go wandering around after Highland and Green. Um, this is the originally called the Commercial Club Building. It was a predecessor's Chamber of Commerce um, building built in 1912 at the corner of 12th and P Streets. Frank is a member and a director at the Commercial Club. Anna is also a member of the Commercial Club, so they both have um, active participation here. This is one of those great renderings that you're sure never was built in this form, and maybe the beautifully dressed people on the street never quite occurred, but the building did. All of those elaborate lights and balconies and cornice that show up in the rendering really were built. Unfortunately, somehow the lights were all removed in the first decade or so. So the later views of it is a much stripped down building and it has since lost its cornice and its balcony, both of which were probably terracotta. Uh, we might know it as the Crane River Building or now Misty's, um, Gallup, um, had space in the upper floors. Jim McKee and I gave a tour of some of these hall-related downtown sites um, about two weeks ago, uh, and we were fortunate enough to get up into the great room behind those five big arched windows. And that's the most splendid room still surviving in the building. It was the dining room, kind of the ballroom of the commercial club, and has that spectacular coffered ceiling um, and rich cornice all around the sides. It had been subject to a drop ceiling and ducts broken through a lot of that plaster work before Gallup and Bob Campbell teamed up and restored the room. And for a time, it was a, a call center for Gallup. Um, it's now vacant, which was probably one reason we got in so people could look at a space they could lease. Um, but a great, a great space. This is designed by Berlinghoff and Davis uh, Lincoln Architects, who also do Miller and Payne, uh, Lincoln High, um, many of the um, premier buildings of the teens. And one of those big ceiling coffers in that room. And you also see the pattern of um, exposed light bulbs between each medallion all around the border of the room. Um, 1912, it was still exciting just to have light bulbs. And so they're a decorative and a very successful decorative element, I think, on this cornice. Moving th chronologically through Hall's impact, we then come to um, the uh, Grand Lincoln Plaza and the Daniel Chester French um, standing Lincoln statue at the state capitol of 1912. Hall, um, again, had a leading role, local role, in gathering the funds for this project. Um, I loved in uh, Matt's talk last month um, that at the dedication, Hall didn't speak as the fundraiser, he spoke as essentially the architectural historian, the art historian, speaking about uh, Mr. French's 
uh, significance in American sculpture. The architect as well, um, Henry Bacon, of the plaza and of the tablet behind the figure um, collaborated with French on major projects. I like to think that they auditioned in Lincoln and then went on to Washington, D.C., where they did the Lincoln Memorial <laughs> together. Um, they did good work here. They did great work here, and it really is the predecessor to Lincoln Memorial. Um, and as Matt emphasized, there were many fathers to this successful project, and Addison Waite, um, Secretary of State, could also properly claim, and it showed the speed of the political process that he could campaign for re-election that fall um, with postcards of his role for the Lincoln statue. I didn't bring them in because they're just um, inscriptions, but Matt emphasized the statue, of course, is signed by Daniel Chester French. It also has the signature of the foundry uh, at which uh, the bronze statue was cast. The work of carving the eagles and, and preparing the um, monument the inscriptions and all on the granite tablet behind was done by the Lincoln firm, the Kimball brothers, and Fred Kimball, the artist sculptor among the brothers, um, did that work. The next year in Wayuka Cemetery, uh, Fred Kimball and his firm produced the Jeanette Thompson Monument, a pink granite tablet with a full height, not nine foot, but a life-size a relief figure of a woman, signed by Fred Kimball on one side, signed by the same New York foundry that had done the Lincoln statue. So the Kimballs in Wayuka are using as good a foundry as Daniel Chester French is using for his Lincoln statue, which I would think must be the best foundry in the country, and that's what the Kimballs are using, perhaps coming off this project as well. And we know, I think, most prominently of uh, Frank Hall's ownership of one of the reduced size uh, bronze casts of the Lincoln statue. He also owned, uh, and, Kim and the Sheldon has, one of the plaster maquettes. And in his inventory for or an inventory of the art given to the Sheldon, uh, in identifying where in the house all of these pieces were, um, both the, the plaster maquette um, and the bronze statue, statuette uh, were both on display in the house. So this represents um, one of those plaster maquettes. Now back to Highland and Green and Mr. Hall's business connections. Just across the street from the Lincoln Building um, at 10th and O on the southwest corner, 1916 the Lincoln Building is topped by the terminal building at 10 stories tall. And Paul V. Highland of Chicago comes back again to do uh, this building. Frank Hall is a director of the terminal company. Lots of prominent Lincoln folks were involved in the streetcar company that built this building. But only one of them had their garden house designed by Paul Highland. That 1911 gazebo that stands in their yard not on the building permit, but on the application for the building permit, identifies Highland and Green in 1911 as the Hall's architect for their beautiful little garden house. The first private project that I know of that had been done in Lincoln by Highland. So he comes back and for a firm connected with Hall across the street from Hall's office, presumably in view of Hall's office, in nine months um, the terminal building is built uh, under the <coughs> design authorship of Paul V. Highland. Um, another wonderful terracotta building, uh, this one terracotta clad on the whole exterior and still retains its beautiful cornice at the top. That same year, 1916, two other houses are designed by Highland in town. Um, and the first is the McAfee House at um, 18th and C Streets. Um, McAfee was Mr. McAfee was an interior designer. Gertrude Marquette McAfee, um, his wife, um, was arguably the source of much of the family wealth, and her father, Turner Marquette, was the early partner to Mr. Hall. 
they're all in the same social group. They don't have to be going through Hall for the architect, but um, they do. They, they do use that same Mr. Highland uh, for this fabulous house, which is one of the most unusual um, townhouses in Lincoln. has lost some of its decorative plaques up at the uh, parapet, but still has this one gorgeous, um, probably the most Sullivan-esque piece we have anywhere in Lincoln um, on the um, north wall of the house. This house then leads me into sheer speculation, but indulge me. Uh, down at 2401 Ryan's, the Fowell House, F-A-W-E-L-L, -L, built for George Fowell Jr. Uh, this is what shows up still on the assessor's site. But if you go by, this is what shows up today. Uh, it is now in um, new ownership and very um, loving work putting the yard and the, this extremely unusual house um, back together again. Built in 1916, same year as the um, McAfee house. We don't have an architect identified with it, but Mr. Fowell Jr.'s mother was sister to Gertrude Marquette McAfee. Uh, she was Hattie Marquette Fowell. So we've got sisters in 1916, or the son of, son of, a nephew and his aunt build these two houses. I don't know that this is Highland. We don't have evidence it's Highland. It is one of the most unusual houses in Lincoln. And now you can see it again, and it's just a joy. But there is one more documented Highland in town, which gives him of the four major buildings, the garden house at the halls is a local landmark, not on the National Register currently, could be if they wished it to be. All the other four um, documented Highland houses in Lincoln are on the National Register. And the last of those, also 1916, was Hall's partner Frank Wood's house uh, on Sheridan Boulevard at 2501. Uh, here transplanting in what we think is a pin oak, or at least it's bare winter tree, but it could be a pin oak. Um, grand, lovely house in an Italian Renaissance revival style. Highland clearly can operate in a broad range of styles. Um, and a spectacular house today under Frank and Joan Haruza's loving care. And a great landscaped yard originally designed by the Chicago architect um, Jens Jensen who did the whole Woodshire, or Woods Crest um, development for the Woods family. And that brings me back to 11th and D and another lovely landscaped yard uh, and the Hall's own house. And to remind you, there's a wonderful exhibit at Sheldon um, through September 16th. And concentrates on both the Hall's own collection and the works acquired um, from their bequests, and it's well worth visiting. Thank you. If you have any questions, I will try to make up answers to them. We have a little time. Roxanne? <coughs> so the Hall's carriage house, they had, they had the coachman, so when, when he drove downtown, <coughs> to his office there on 10th Street, would he have parked in Haymarket Square? <laughs> Roxanne's question was whether the Hall's coachman dropping him off at his office downtown would have parked at Haymarket Square. No. <laughs> Haymarket Square, the original Haymarket Square, was where the post office and courthouse was built. Um, the city then kind of moved that function up to, so it was between 10th and, 9th and 10th and um, O and P, but the post office is being built by the 1870s, and Mr. Hall comes to town about 1880. There were lots of livery stables downtown. I don't know too much the work habits of coachmen. Maybe they drove the coach right back to their own carriage house and waited until he rung them up on one of the two competing telephone systems that there were in Lincoln at that time. Um, 
I don't know if they, I imagine they convert, I'm sure they convert the house to a garage before the end of their time, 1928, uh, in the house. Um, but there were livery stables downtown. One that still survives, we call the Palace Livery Stable on M Street between 11th and 12th on the south side, just opposite um, St. Paul Church. There's still a red brick livery stable there, but there were lots of livery stables downtown. Yes. Is the current color of the home more consistent with what it would have been when it was built? The question of whether the current color of the house is, is more consistent, and I, I believe it is much more consistent. I don't think it's based on evidence of original colors, but if we look at those earliest views, and we could do that, I think. That's not an all-white house. Um, I think there's clearly a, a body tone, colors picking out the windows, and they, I think they very carefully worked from the half-tone view, or the gray-tone views of these early views in picking colors, and they are characteristic colors of the time, um, but I don't, don't think they have direct evidence of the original colors. They're so much more successful. I think they also, relying on this, did not do what you sometimes see on the Queen Anne's, which can be fun, but of colors picking out each different band of, of shingle or something. Um, and I think we do... We, we can see now, even in that monotone up in the gable end, the variety to that, that cut shingle work. But they haven't done a San Francisco painted lady which are fun for their own purpose, but aren't the original, aren't the early view of this house. Roxanne. In that view, what would be a more appropriate shingle treatment, or would there be a more appropriate shingle treatment for that porch? The, the, this, this roof is, especially from this view, I, although I'm, I think here the, um, the photo probably doesn't do justice to the effect in the yard, especially once you're inside the space, you're not really looking at the porch roof. Um, standing across the street, you kind of are because of how long that porch roof is and what a spread of porch they, they created. Um, probably may well have been, by the time when they were putting this on in the early 20th century, probably was a wood shingle, um, which is hard to replicate today, particularly for the durability of, of the wood shingle available today. It probably was, was something more of a wood shingle. In that picture you showed of the house, the oldest picture you showed of the house, it looks almost like it's uh, every floor is a different color. Maybe. It, it, it may be, it, there's an observation that maybe the, each floor was painted a different color, and it's, it's hard to be sure. And they, was that done? I, th I think you see that on some. Certainly the um, gables. The, well, the, the gable, but, but then we're also um, looking at a gable here that's, that's projecting out um, forward of a, a little ways for the walls below it. And so there'd be a little different shadow effect, too. I'm not certain that the gable end would have been a different color. I think we just don't have a lot of visual evidence. It's surprising, like Silas Burnham's house next door, which is what you see at the left edge of the view is the best picture I have of it currently. Um, you think all of these grand houses would have grand photos, and maybe they do, but we haven't found them yet, or they don't survive. Um, this is the best view, and it's a half tone off, I think it was called Lincoln Souvenir, and it was about, it was early 1890s or so, I think it was issued. Um, it's not a great, great representation, unfortunately, great house. We're particularly fortunate, I think, that it's in the hands of great owners who are doing just fabulous things with it. Peter. Where, where did they shop? Did they buy locally? Uh, the question of where they shopped, and I'll, 
answer not the question you asked, Peter, but the one I have any information on. That's what I meant. <laughs> In the catalog for the exhibit, um, Anna Hall does a lovely job talking about how they collected art. And they began by collecting, they had a couple pieces that he had, prints he had picked up with a newspaper he subscribed to. And then the traveling art salespeople would come to their door. Obviously there was a mark on their gate. Um, and she talked about they weren't always real sure what they were being shown. And sometimes she would call Mr. Hall home from the office if there was something interesting, but she wasn't sure if it was real or not. And they began collecting art with folks visiting them at the door. They also traveled extensively, and part of their collection clearly was lovely mementos of places they had visited in Europe and elsewhere, and good, very good quality pieces that they were picking up. And then they just broadened their knowledge and their collecting. For the more mundane um, places to shop, um, we certainly had small grocery stores scattered all through the community, although I think that probably becomes a housekeeper's function. Probably becomes a housekeeper's function, not, not Mrs. Hall's. She mentions in the early years of their marriage, um, she milked the cow twice daily, um, I think living up near um, just north and east of campus, uh, near what would be the Lewis Seifert House. Um, so they don't start with wealth. Um, they they make, make their way in Lincoln, and rather quickly, in those boom years of the 1880s. Probably fortunate that they're establishing themselves in the 1880s professionally and economically, and then are in a better position probably than, than very, very many. They haven't overspent um, and don't crash in the 1890s like many others did. They traveled extensively, so I'm sure that some of their their personal goods were also from around the country and around the world. You don't know what lumber yard they were. I don't know their lumber yard. The, the terracotta um, may have been coming up from Kansas City as a source of a lot of Lincoln terracotta, although certainly could be shipped anywhere in the country by by the time they're they're building. Nothing else. I appreciate you being here today and enjoy our beautiful August autumnal weather. <laughs>